Hello everyone and welcome to Happy Little Diodes. Today we're going to be looking at an issue 6A Spectrum 48K that my boss found in his attic. He was totally convinced that it's a non-starter, but it seemed to me like a good opportunity to make a repair video. I grew up with computers, taking them to bits, breaking them, repairing them, and making my own NAF games on the Amiga, and I've always wanted to go on a bit of a pilgrimage to learn about the Spectrum, as I was too young at the time to appreciate it. Stick around until the end for a text adventure account of how I ended up with this Spectrum. The first thing I noticed is this silver plate that tells me this machine came from Pyramid Micros in Warrington. Obviously it's no longer there, but I had a look around on Google and found some threads in which people shared a few memories of the place. So there's a nice bit of history associated with this computer. Nothing seems massively out of order. The keys are grimy around the sides and the edge connector is a bit dull, but nothing's physically broken. The sticker on the back shows that it was sold as a 48K, that is, with 48 kilobytes of user memory, as opposed to the cheaper 16K. I was told that it didn't boot at all, so I wanted to plug it in and see if that really was the case. I didn't get a power supply with it, so I'm using this aftermarket power supply, and it was probably a good idea to test the output. The 48K requires a minimum of 9 volts and 1 amp DC, with the negative being on the inside of the barrel. Looks good. Plugging it in produced no video, and crucially, no whirring sound from within the computer. Pressing and holding a key should produce a rapid ticking, but this didn't happen either, so it seems like something is majorly knackered. Time to open it up. There are five screws to remove. Once inside, I'm going to check that the 9 volts from our power supply is reaching the voltage regulator, and that the voltage regulator is doing its job and producing a steady 5 volts. This square black thing with three legs is the regulator. The regulator is bolted to this massive plate of metal to dissipate all the waste energy from turning 9 volts into 5 volts. The heatsink is also a handy ground for our voltage test. Using the multimeter set to 20 volts, and using the heatsink as a ground, shows that the 9 volt supply on pin 1 and the 5 volt output on pin 3 are correct. So we need to look further down the line. There are two banks of usable memory in the 48k, the base or lower 16k and the upper 32k. These two banks use different chips that require different supply voltages, so it's important to check them all. The 4116 chips that make up the lower bank require three different supply voltages, plus 5 volts, minus 5 volts and plus 12 volts. The upper bank's 4532 chips only take plus 5 volts. I found that the minus 5 volt supply to the lower bank was at 0, and the 12 volt supply was at 2.3 volts, definitely knackered. The 5 volt supply to the upper memory was fine. So, how do you generate minus 5 and plus 12 volts? Without going into detail, because I don't understand the detail, this circuit produces the extra supplies. Transistors TR4 and TR5 are totally integral to this. When these are dead, you won't get the right voltages. This kind of failure often happens when two contacts on the edge connector are shorted while the spectrum is switched on. There isn't much to prevent this happening, and the edge connector contacts include plus 12 volts unregulated, easily enough to toast your transistors. Time to operate. I replace the two transistors, being careful to use the correct replacements in the correct orientation. These are available from specialist online repair shops, and it's handy to use them to make sure you're choosing the right parts. Once the transistors were replaced, the Speccy booted up to this slightly garbled boot screen. The good news is the colour looks ok. The bad news is something else is clearly knackered. The biggest chip in the machine is the ULA, or the Uncommitted Logic Array. One of this chip's responsibilities is to grab video data from memory and output it to the video circuit. As this chip is already socketed, it's very easy to remove, so I decided to test this first. It's hard to get a like-for-like -like replacement for this chip, so I put in a VLA82, which is a surface-mounted chip on a tiny PCB that matches the shape of the ULA. It's plug-and-play, which is great, 
The only real difference is that it doesn't look the same. It took a fair bit of force to get this into the socket, which might have something to do with some of the issues we see later on. And there it is, no more garbled text. The next check is a bit nerve-wracking. We need to know if any of the RAM chips were frazzled when the computer first died. Fortunately, the Spectrum checks this all on its own during the boot sequence and stores the result in readable memory. Oh, and I should add, the keyboard membrane had to be replaced because it had pretty much disintegrated. After doing this, I was able to do the memory check. Entering this command will return the address of the highest addressable location in memory. In this case, we get 32767, which is 32K. This actually means we effectively have a Spectrum 16K. It can see the 16K of read-only memory from the chip in the top right, and the 16K of usable memory in the lower memory bank. The entire 32K of upper memory is not working correctly. Now, I'm going to get into a bit of detail here, so if you find this stuff boring, here's a video of my cat's play fighting to get you through it. Each of the 8 chips in the upper memory bank contributes 1 bit to a byte stored in upper RAM. This makes diagnostics really easy. If a chip is broken, it's going to always return 1, or always return 0, regardless of what we tell it to store. The usual test is to write 85 to a location in upper memory, which is 01010101 in binary, and read back the result. If we get, say, 93, we can convert that back to binary, 01011101, and we can tell that bit 3 is stuck on. That means we need to replace the chip that corresponds to bit 3. In our case, it was bit 5 that was stuck on, and I can demonstrate this really nicely by writing 0 to an address in upper memory and reading it back. We get 32, which is 2 to the power 5. You should also check that writing 255, which is all 1s, actually returns 255. This shows that none of the chips is stuck at 0. Now that we know which chip is at fault, it needs to be removed. This is a bit of a pain as there are a lot of joints to desolder which requires a lot of care and patience. It's a good idea to add solder to an old joint to help it all to flow a bit easier when heated. I used a solder sucker, but solder wick is also a good addition. Take care to ensure all the pins are moving free before trying to remove the chip and clean up any solder splashes when powering the machine back up. In the end I used a heat gun to finally remove the chip, which worked a treat. It's a good idea to use a socket when replacing chips like this, just in case the chip needs to come out again in the future. What I'm doing here is just applying a little bit of pressure to the socket while heating one of the joints. This means that the socket's going to sit flush. The last thing to do is get a replacement chip from the box of goodies and we should be back up to 64k of memory. We've now got a working Spectrum with all 48k of its memory back, and a working keyboard. It's tempting to try and load a game, but first I wanted to change the capacitors. 
Don't forget that this thing's nearly 40 years old. You can buy these sets from retro online shops which is really convenient and saves on buying the wrong parts. I chose to remove the caps by clipping one end, bending the cap away from the board and then removing the legs while applying heat to the back of the board. A small desk vise is useful for holding the board in place while you do this. The last thing I wanted to do was a composite video mod. Basically, the Spectrum generates a lovely composite AV signal, which it then churns through the RF box so old TVs can tune into it. New TVs can take the composite signal, which removed a lot of parts that can potentially go wrong. The result should be a nice clean picture. You can achieve this mod with a single wire, and some people even do it without solder, but I wanted to do a proper job, so I put a capacitor in place of the wire. Let's have a quick recap. We started with a totally dead spectrum. Replacing TR4 and TR5 got it running, but with garbled video. A new ULA fixed that, and a new keyboard membrane allowed us to test the RAM, which showed we had a dead chip. After replacing the dead chip, we were back at 48k. We've had new capacitors all round, and done a composite video mod. Now we can finally try and load a game. Well, the good news is it loads. I didn't use a tape by the way, I used a WAV file which is more reliable, but our colours are clearly knackered. What's interesting is, I can fix the colours by touching these resistors. Hmm. It was tempting to replace the video chip as this handles the colours, but the quickest thing to try is a different ULA. This has a big role in generating the video output, so it's worth a try. Luckily, I actually have another 48k on the go which also needed a new ULA, so I can just swap these VLAs around. And there it is, Manic Miner in all its glory. It looks absolutely class and I'm going to play it for a bit now, I think I've earned it. You enter a clearing, the path leads north. Walk. North. 
Do you not understand what? Walk north. Walk north. You wander along the winding trail, nervously peering into the dense forest either side. Suddenly, you nearly step into a huge pile of leaves. Look at pile. Do not look at leaves. Within the leaves, you hear movement. A pair of red eyes illuminate from within the decay. It's your boss. Talk to boss. Do not fight boss. Hmm. Ask boss if he has any retro computers in need of repair. The eyes disappear and a suited arm emerges brandishing a device. Take device. <laughs> 